The House will come to order. Members will be at their seats. The clerk has opened the roll. You may record your presence. Please rise and give your attention to our guest chaplain, Pastor Rob Self, Topeka Lakeview Church of the Nazarene, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Representative Vaughn. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us to gather today. I'd ask that, Lord, you would just speak into the hearts and the minds of your people, that, God, your sovereign will would be done today. I'd ask that you be with those that were unable to make it today. I think of uh, Chaplain Eunice Brubaker as well. Lord, we just ask that your healing hand would be upon her. We ask that your hand would also be upon those in Ukraine today, that they would shelter and protect them and give them strength. Lord, be with us this morning. I ask that you're a part of everything that's done today. And as these representatives have gathered today, would speak the heart and the mind of your people. We ask this now in Christ's name. And all God's children said, Amen. Has every member had the opportunity to record their presence? The clerk will close the roll and record the attendance. Body, before we start today, I'd like to welcome back Representative Finney to the House floor. It's great to see you. Uh, the speaker recognizes Representative Lynn on a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, I'm here to recognize the 2022 Kansas and the 2020 National Miss Amazing representatives. Miss Amazing is founded on the principles of ensuring equal opportunities for girls and women living with disabilities. The organization's mission is to equip girls and women to write their own story, build meaningful relationships with peers, empower parents and family, and support professionals to be effective allies. Miss Amazing looks to dismantle stereotypes and open up pathways for personal growth while building self-esteem and promoting their boundless potential. They hold regular opportunities to teach leadership skills, including one where I got to teach the girls how Kansas laws are made. And then they have fun events like fashion shows, karaoke nights, painting classes, among other things. Miss Amazing looks to challenge these young women to take pride in their identities and their strengths, set ambitious goals, advocate for better policy, to speak up for others, to pursue their greatest versions of themselves. And by their contributions, we as a society will reap those benefits as well. 
Every year, Miss Amazing holds their annual Amplify event, and I was privileged to be a judge in 2020. And today, I'd like to honor our crowned Kansas and national Miss Amazing representatives. Isabella Paul Ross is our 2022 Miss Amazing Kansas preteen. She's from Gardner, and the most important thing for her is to accept others for who they are and knowing she can do anything she wants regardless of her disability. Jennifer Jennings is our 2022 Kansas Miss Amazing teen from Overland Park. Jennifer hopes to attend Calvary University and would like to have her own ministry where she can help people with disabilities of all ages find their courage and inner strength to amplify their voices. Autumn Bertles is our 2022 Kansas Miss Amazing Junior Miss from Lawrence, and she loves informing and advocating for people with disabilities. She's also currently a student at KU where she's majoring in engineering. Sarah Pedig is our Kansas Miss Amazing Miss from Shawnee. Sarah works at Chick-fil-A and is part of an inclusive dance team and cheer squad. Sarah spends her spare time volunteering for Children's Mercy. And Shirley Cook is our current senior Miss from Olathe. Shirley loves to educate others about sharks and their importance. She lives independently with her cat and is currently engaged in planning her wedding. And I am lucky to call her my constituent. In addition to these state representatives, Kansas is proud to have two national Miss Amazing representatives. Abby Martin is a 13-year-old resident of Chanute and is now the national Miss Amazing preteen queen. Recently, her disabilities have become more challenging from being a competitive dancer to using her wheelchair more frequently. But even through these circumstances, she continues to help others regardless of her own challenges. She visits nursing homes to comfort those with dementia, collects items for the homeless. She advocates for others because she believes everyone deserves to be treated equally and fairly. And Christiana Guerrero is from Topeka, and she is the national Miss Amazing Teen. She's funky and spunky 20-year-old whose personality cannot be summed up. She loves bringing everything she is to everything she does and brightens every day to those around her. She lives life boldly being herself while encouraging and engaging with everyone she meets. Christiana is putting together the first disability pride parade that she hopes to hold in Topeka in July. She knows that she doesn't need to measure up or change herself to fit the crown, but the crown amplifies who she is and gives her opportunities to reach others. Her biggest passion is reminding everyone they're loved, encouraging you to love yourself, and empowering you with ways to live boldly. And finally, Kansas Miss Amazing is led by their amazing director, Michelle Roberts. Body, please join me in congratulating our Kansas and National Miss Amazing representatives. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like my remarks to be spread across the journal. Without objection, so ordered. Introduction of the Bills of Concurrent Resolutions of Clerk will read. House Bill number 2737 by the Committee on Federal and State Affairs, an act concerning reapportionment relating to state representative districts providing for the reapportionment thereof. House Bill number 2738 by the Committee on Taxation, an act concerning sales taxation relating to countywide retailer sales tax, discontinued discontinuing an Atchison countywide retailer sales tax, allowing counties to decide whether to apportion revenue between the county and cities located therein. Messages from the Senate. The clerk will read. Senate non-concurs and House amendments to House Substitute for Senate Bill 286 requests a conference to appoint Senators Warren, Wilburn, and Haley as conferees in the part of the Senate, announcing passage of Senate Bills 403 and 507. Senate Bill Number 403 by the Committee on Assessment and Taxation, an act concerning sales and compensating use tax relating to city and countywide retailer sales tax, Wilson County election and rates. Senate Bill Number 507 by the Committee on Federal and State Affairs, an act concerning open records relating to disclosure of records under the Open Records Act, continuing in existence certain exceptions to disclosure. Speaker recognized Majorlia Hawkins for a motion to accede. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Senate did not concur in the House amendments to Senate Bill 2. I move the House accede to the request of the Senate and that a conference committee be appointed. You friend the motion, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those no. Motion carries. As conferees, as part of the House, the chair appoints Representative Barker, Hamburger, Blue, and Ruiz. Majority Leader Hawkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. The Senate did not concur in the House amendments to Senate Bill 421. I move the House accede to the request of the Senate and that a conference committee be appointed. You heard the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. As conferees as part of the House, the Speaker appoints Representative Stephen Johnson, Croft, and Neighbor. Majority Leader Hawkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Senate did not concur in the House amendments to House substitute for a Senate substitute of Senate Bill 286. I move the House accede to the request of the Senate and that a conference committee be, re, uh, be appointed. You heard the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. As conferees as part of the House, the Speaker appoints the law firm of Patton, Ralph, and Carmichael. Introductions of the original motions and the House resolutions, the clerk will read. House resolution number 6024 by Representative Schreiber, Amex, and others. A resolution congratulating and commending the 2020 and 2022 Kansas Master Teachers. On HR 6024, the chair recognizes Representative Schreiber for a motion to adopt the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, I'm honored to introduce the 2020 and 2022 classes of Kansas Master Teachers. We were not able to honor the 2020 class due to the pandemic, and the pandemic also caused the cancellation of the teacher selection in 2021. The Kansas Master Teacher Program was established in 1954 by the Kansas State Teachers College, now called Emporia State University. The recipients of this award are selected by a 10-member committee and since 1980, Bank of America has pledged more than $100,000 to permanently endow this program. Additionally, in 1984, the Black family of Broken Bow, Oklahoma, established an endowed chair for Kansas master teachers. The fund provides a stipend to bring two master teachers to Emporia State for several days so they can share their teaching experiences with education students. By taking the time to give back, these master teachers strengthen the teaching profession and serve as role models for the new teachers. The class members are, for 2022, Andy Battenfeld, physical education teacher, Emporia, in Village Elementary. Melanie Hammond, chemistry physical science teacher, South High School, Salina. Karen Stolman Henderson, math and engineering teacher, Northwest High School, Blue Valley. Sarah M. Hoff, social studies teacher, Dodge City High School, Dodge City. Gina Johnson, fourth and fifth grade teacher, O'Laughlin Elementary School, Hayes. Brian Scruggs, instructional coach, Sites Elementary School, Geary County. Barbara Tholen, journalism advisor, graphic design teacher, Lawrence High School, Lawrence. And for 2020, Hillary Barzuski, first grade teacher, Cottonwood Elementary School, Andover. Holly Bright, kindergarten teacher, Grandview Elementary School, El Dorado. Justin Hickey, seventh grade physical education teacher, Comanche Middle School, Dodge City. Erica Huggard, biology health science teacher, Emporia High School in Emporia. Eunice Izizaga, second grade teacher, Pleasant Valley Elementary School, Wichita. Vicki Marcosi, art enrichment reading and writing grades two through five, Oakdale Elementary School in Salina. And Kathy Wagner, English teacher, Hayes High School in Hayes. I just want to share the words of another great teacher named Barbara Morgan. Ms. Morgan is better known as the backup teacher to Krista McAuliffe, the teacher on the Challenger mission that ended in disaster. Ms. Morgan began her teaching career on a reservation in Montana. She was selected as the alternate for the Challenger mission in 1985. She later became a full-time astronaut, and when she finished her space career, she continued to teach at Boise State University and condensed her philosophy on teaching with these words. Reach for your dreams. The sky is no limit. We recognize our master teachers this morning, but every school day there are teachers across Kansas urging their students to reach for their dreams. 
The 2020 and 2022 classes of master teachers are in the East Gallery today, and I ask them now to stand and be recognized. Please help me congratulate them. Mr. Speaker, I move adoption of House Resolution 6024 and would like my words spread across the journal. Before the motion, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion carries. The resolution is adopted. And without objection, so ordered. Announcements. Representative Woodard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Democrats, we will have an agenda immediately upon recess in 142 South. That is a different room. Immediately upon recess, 142 South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Majority Leader Hawkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, body, we neither side had the opportunity this morning to discuss a concur on 2279. So that's what we'll be doing. Republicans, we will stay in here in the in the House chambers. And we will discuss the concurrent here. Mr. Speaker, I move the House recess until 11.35 a.m. You've heard the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. Those no, we are in recess. House will be in order. Speaker, recognize Representative Hawkins for a motion to concur on House Bill 2279. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the House concur in Senate amendments to Senate substitute for House Bill 2279, and I will stand for questions. For discussion, Representative Landwehr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to make a substitute motion not to concur on Senate sub for House 2279. This is a debatable motion. Is there a discussion? Representative Epley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is sort of the uh, uncorked APRN bill, I guess, so to speak, as we'll call it, for those of us that have been around for the other issues related to uncorked Kansas. I do think it's smart to send this back to committee for some more work, and I would ask your support of that. Thank you very much. Representative Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I support sending it back to conference. Uh, this has been, I've been uh, part of this debate for a good share of the 10 years I've spent in health. And uh, time after time, uh, compromises have been offered. A couple years ago, it was down, if you, you can ditch the agreement, if you become a, uh, come under the Board of Healing Arts. And that was the only restriction at that time, and it did not happen. It was not agreed to. But I think it's important. I think it's important to send it back to committee, not to pass it on. And especially and to me, the Board of Healing Arts is important in my mind, just for the fact if you want to walk like a doc, quack like a doc, 
you ought to be under the same board that docs are under and PAs are under. So I, I think it needs a lot of work. I don't think it needs to come out, and I support sending it to, back to uh, uh, for a review. Conference. Representative uh, Clifford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also feel that this should go back to committee. Uh, I was in the Senate gallery when they were discussing this uh, bill. Uh, when the motion was considered to vote, there was a voice vote. Uh, I thought the AIs had it, and there was a rapid gavel before the division could be uh, called. Uh, so I think it was a slam dunk push through process. Uh, we did not see regular order in the Senate. I think we deserve to go back to committee in the House, uh, and I will be voting for this. Thank you. Representative Blex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, I'll ask her that. It, would you stand for a question, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. When you made your motion, was that, you said committee, not conference committee. In my understanding, it will go back. Will it go back to your committee on the House side, or will it go to conference committee? No, that was a, an error on my part. Okay. Believe it or not, I had a lack of words. I want that marked on everybody's calendar that that happened. So my motion should have been to non-concur and that a conference committee be appointed. And that's what I will make when I step back up. Okay, thank you for that. And, it, and, and technically, I think at this point in time, uh, it's probably to, to take it back to conference committee. Uh, there's, but there's a lot of things that's been said I don't agree with, and it's not quite exactly true. And, and, and I have some real concerns with uh, things like surgery. Uh, currently, under the scope of practice, APRNs have the ability to stitch up a little bit or remove sutures. Uh, if you break the skin, I guess that's surgery, but uh, I guess I'd probably support taking it back to conference committee, but not committee. Thank you, ma'am. Representative Garber. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do not support sending it back to the conference committee. I think we need to concur with this bill and let the APRNs do what they can do and we're, we're hearing all this frightful stuff happening my caregiver is an aprn my previous caregiver two years ago was a doctor i disagreed with some of the things that happened between him and my family and we changed to an aprn first i had a male now i have a female and I fully trust what they do and say, and if I don't trust, I can question them. It's unfortunate that we live in a society today that does not allow you to question your caregiver. But they're the law, just like the Supreme Court, right? We should be allowed to have control of our bodies. Those of you who say, my body, my choice, I would think you would be for this. I'll tell you another story. We have a new doctor in my area, and a person came in to have a splinter removed from under their thumbnail. This doctor's first reaction was, I have to go talk to another doctor. Now, these doctors have all this training, and I'm not putting down doctors at all. I appreciate what they do. But I really believe that APRNs have the ability to do, within their scope, what this bill will allow them to do. So I'm going to not support the non-concur and support the concur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seeing no other discussion, Representative, you may close on your substitute motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Or Mr. Speaker, I apologize. Um, one thing you will notice absent in this bill is statute KSA 6511.13. If the APRNs are wanting to do what they say they want to do, they will be prevented from doing it in this bill. 
This is why you don't circumvent the process. This bill in its current form only gives them prescriptive authority. We've had the revisers look at it every which direction. So if all they're wanting is prescriptive authority, that's what they will get in this bill. So Mr. Speaker, I would move that we non-concur on Senate amendments to substitute for Senate Bill 2279 and the conference committee be appointed. You for the motion, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion, no. motion passes. The speaker appoints, the vision has been requested. The clerk will open the roll and you may record your vote. The clerk will close the roll. 91 voted in favor, 26 against. Motion carries. The speaker appoints Representative Lanwer, Epley, and Rees as conferees as part of the House. Speaker recognizes Majority Leader Hawkins for motion to resolve itself to the Committee of the Whole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the House resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for the purpose of of considering those items under the heading of general orders. You've heard the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those no. The ayes have it. The motion carries. The chair appoints Representative Highland to chair the committee of the whole. Thank you, thank you very much. First item of business is House Concurrent Resolution 5032. For the purpose of carrying this House Current Resolution 532, the chair recognizes Representative Finch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the body. I would ask the representative from Douglas County to join me. I rise today with my colleague uh, in strong support of HCR 5032 and in support of the brave people of Ukraine. On February 24th of this year, the Russian army poured across the Ukraine's so sovereign borders in an attempt to complete an invasion that they had been working on piecemeal for nearly eight years. This act of tyrannical aggression was met with defiant courage by the people of Ukraine. Russian intelligence believed that they would fold quickly and the country would soon fall. They were wrong. The invasion of Ukraine is the largest military action in Europe since the close of World War II. It's, an, it's in violation of international law and the norms by which nation states have conducted themselves since the Axis powers were defeated in 1945. You know, history will not long remember the words that we utter here today in support of the Ukrainian people and against the Russian invasion, but they will remember the images of a children's hospital bombed to rubble a pregnant woman being carried on a litter, and the lines of baby strollers at train stations at the Polish border, placed there by Polish mothers for Ukrainian women and children fleeing across the border. And as of this morning, it's about 1.8 million women and children that have fled Ukraine. History will also remember the indomitable spirit of the Ukrainian people taking up arms against a tyrannical invader and literally giving their lives to protect their homeland. May we all have that kind of courage if we are ever so tested. They embody the fighting spirit expressed by Winston Churchill when he said in 1941, never give in, never, 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 in nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. I'd like to uh, thank the speaker for his eloquent words. I think those of you who were at the rally we had on the steps uh, last week may have heard me give a shout out to my friend Lubomir Timkiv in Lviv. Uh, 
I've heard word through a second party that he was safe as of a couple of days ago, but that was before the bombing started in that area in the West. Um, you know, those of you who have been here for a while have heard me come up and question whether this body has the uh, foreign policy experience to, to make decisions like this. But I think this is a, this, a, an issue where you don't need any foreign policy experience to know what's right and what's wrong. Uh, there's been a clear, uh, a sovereign, independent nation has been attacked without provocation. And as, as uh, the previous speaker pointed out, millions of people have fled the country already. You know, there will be some people here who, who will say, this is none of the business in the United States. We don't have, we shouldn't be involved at all. But to that I would say, if you really want to live in a world where Vladimir Putin can do anything he wants to and get away with it, I'd think again. You know, every year we pass a resolution supporting uh, our relationship with the Republic of Taiwan. You know, the Chinese government is taking notes. If this stands, Taiwan will be next. So if you support Taiwan, you should support this. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, we'll stand for questions. Does any member desire to speak to the bill? The chair recognizes Representative Smith to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the uh, leadership for bringing this forward. This is a, a wonderful example of bipartisanship. And I want to thank those who attended the rally we held two weeks ago on the steps of the Capitol. And I especially want to thank the representative from Salina who spoke so eloquently. Ukraine is an independent country. My son was a UN elections observer twice in the last two elections in that country. They elected their leaders democratically. Those of you who were at the rally two weeks ago heard from two KU students from Ukraine, Mikola and Alina. I would like to update you on the latest from those two. Mikola and Alina both have contacted me and are asking for help to get their families out of the country. Alina's grade school was destroyed, as she said, and both of their cities are now being attacked. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of HCR 5032, and I hope this can be a unanimous vote. For further discussion, the chair recognizes Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> When this, when this uh, resolution came, again, came across my desk last night, I was bothered by it. Not because I don't support the sovereignty of Ukraine um, and, the, and the Ukrainian people, but because there's a line, line six on page two, that talks about giving aid and support to the Ukrainian people. You know, borders do matter and Ukraine never should have been invaded at all. But neither should we on our southern border. And so we want to spend, as heard on the news, billions of dollars to send to Ukraine. And yet, we're being attacked on our southern border and we're not doing anything at all about it. You know, I really like the Senate's resolution that they passed to punish you, Russia, by saying that we're not going to buy any more Russian oil in the U.S. That needs to happen. Russia doesn't get a pass. And I'd love to be able to support this resolution, but I cannot support the United States yet again giving billions of dollars to another country to support their borders and to secure their borders when we've completely left our southern border open and millions of people are coming across and we're not even talking about it. It's for those reasons that I can't support this resolution. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, Representative Finch, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the body. I would ask that you join me in honoring the will of the Ukrainian people, condemning the invasion of their country, and praying for their success. 
May God grant them victory and may God bless the people of Ukraine as he has blessed the people of Kansas. And that I move that when the committee rise and report it, report HCR 5032 favorably for passage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've heard the motion by Representative Finch to report House Concurrent Resolution 5032 favorably. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. They do have it. The motion passes. Our next order of business is House Bill 2674. For the purpose of carrying House Bill 2674, the chair recognizes Representative Owens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There were committee amendments. Uh, as a result, I move adoption of the committee report as amended. You've moved the committee report? Yes. You've heard the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, no. Please continue. It is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, colleagues, House Bill 2674 comes to us from judiciary, but not before coming through corrections to the House floor and then back to judiciary, where the smart attorney brains had to get involved in making sure that this was written out correctly. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, it's important to know, many of you know that this is one of the industries in which uh, I operate, but what this bill does is this provides that a defendant that fails to appear in court uh, shall have a warrant issued if they fail to appear in court. There are 18 states and counting now that require when an arrest is made that a warrant be issued before that defendant can be taken back to custody. As many, many of you guys are aware, um, that's an important function of what the bonding industry does uh, for the defendants in Kansas. And ensuring that they have the ability and the tools and the warrant issued to do so is an important part of that. It also requires that uh, if it is a felony warrant, that that be put in NCIC, which is the National Crime Information Center, so that law enforcement nationwide can be made aware of that. With that in mind, I will stand for questions. Does any member desire to speak to the bill? The chair recognizes Representative Heiberger. Thank you for your patience, Body. I didn't intend to be up here in this bill today. I think the speaker did a fine job of explaining what it does. I do have a concern about it, though. I mean, uh, as he pointed out, that now, if this bill passes, it will be a condition of release to waive one's uh, right to extradition. And I... Wrong bill. Wrong bill. Okay. Um, can you show me your notes real quick, then? Sure. If you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, we did hear, and I understand the confusion, there was a bill that was introduced by Johnson County Sheriff's Department that, that required a waiver of extradition when a bond was posted. That is not part of this bill. This bill specifically deals with the requirement that a warrant be issued um, as a result of a failure to appear, uh, and that if it is a felony failure to appear, that that will be done, um, that will be entered in NCIC within 14 days. Uh, it does state that if the defendant has been arrested outside of Kansas and the prosecuting attorney has declined to proceed with extradition, then there would be resolution that way. Well, sorry, I'm subbing and I didn't do my homework uh, well enough. So uh, I think the speaker did a fine job and I appreciate your, your patience. If there is no further discussion, Representative Owens, you may close. Sorry about that. Representative Carmichael is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The error was mine, not the distinguished representative from Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Seeing no further discussion or the chair recognizes Representative Holmes. You may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my colleagues for the clarification. Um, as we work through these pieces of legislation, we often hear a lot of the same terms, different bills, different approaches. And so it's good that we work through this and that we have a very important process to do so. So with that, Mr. Chair, um, I move that when the committee rises and reports, it, rep it reports HB 2674 favorably for passage. You have heard the motion by Representative Owens to report 2674 favorably. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, no. 
The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The motion passes. <laughs> the next item of business is House Bill 2541. For the purpose of carrying House Bill 2541, the chair recognizes Representative Sutton. Amendments. All right. House Bill 2541 comes to you courtesy of the Appropriations Committee, uh, where, as I mentioned, there were no committee amendments. Uh, 2541 would direct the amount going into the Judicial Branch Fee Fund from the driver's license reinstatement fees, Supreme Court docket fees, district court docket fees, marriage license fees, and Judicial Branch surcharge to now go through the State General Fund. Once this change is made, then the appropriation will be made through the normal budget process to the judicial branch. Uh, the thought process behind this is that, first off, understand that the majority of the judicial branch budget is salaries and wages. Uh, about 20% of their budget comes from these various surcharges, uh, a very volatile source of, of income uh, which is not something you want when managing your payroll. Uh, so what they're looking to do is diversify, in a sense, uh, and receive the revenue from SGF, like 80% of the rest of their budget, uh, and instead remit the surcharges to SGF. Just, and I like it because it cleans up the bookkeeping a whole lot, makes the accounting a, a much more honest and predictable, and I think that's really what the judicial branch is looking for, is predictability in their budgeting uh, process. Uh, the proponents were the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, the Kansas Bar Association, the Kansas District Judges Association. Um, fiscal note, this, there is a fiscal note uh, listed because it's probably going to be about 29 or 30 million dollars a year. This should long term work out to be completely budget neutral, however, uh, because rather than the surcharges going to the judicial branch, they're going to SGF, which is then reappropriated through the normal, re the normal appropriations process back to the judicial branch. Uh, with that, I will stand for questions. Any member would desire to speak to the bill? The chair recognizes Representative Wolfmore from Wyandotte. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think I can add much to that explanation, um, but it is, was suggested and brought to us by um, the um, Barla Lukert from the Supreme Court. It is their um, idea to do this, and I think this will ensure stability in the court system and continue to buy, provide good court system service to the people of Kansas. So I fully support this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For further discussion, the chair recognizes Representative Helgerson. I was asked a couple times to be a little bit more calm and patient down here, so I'll try to do that first of all. This is an innocuous bill in that we're just transferring money. We're just taking it in fees and we're gonna spend it in a different way, but it doesn't do anything. We don't change the appropriation process. We go along our merry ways with the executive branch. We automatically approve their budget. The legislature, we automatically approve their budget. Judiciary. Now we're in the process of accepting and re reinforcing exactly what they're saying to us. Now, in 40 years of watching the budget, I've never seen the uh, judiciary ever come in and say, we got to cut our budget. We're being more efficient. What we have always seen is more and more increases. And I know we have to have it. And I know we need it. This has been, this bill, this way of getting fees has been an automatic check to legislators to say, wait a minute, are these fees going to take care of the judiciary that we want? Or are we raising the bar of costs for the judiciary? 
if we're not asking those kind of questions and asking whether or not we are being efficient or they are being efficient, it will continue to rise. And I hear many people talk about the need for efficiencies and running it like a business. You know, I heard the Judicial Budget Committee say that to do what they need to do in the budget bill that was passed by the Appropriations Committee, they only needed 29 people rather than the 58 the governor and the legislature so far approved. They can't do it, though, because we have a re restriction on one judge per county. But in 40 years, the judiciary has never come in to say, let's be efficient and let's el eliminate that because we can get by by doing it a little different way. You know, this is kind of a little bit of, you know, in-house ba baseball in that if you're not on the appropriation committee, you know, you don't pay it as much attention. But what happens is you grow this budget by two or three or four or five hundred thousand dollars, and most of you don't even pay any attention to it. You know, this year, when you add in the state general fund spending and the spark spending that we're going to do, or not, I'm sorry, only a few people are going to be allowed to make, we're going to go over ten billion dollars in funding that we're going to spend or authorize. That is a first in our state. $10 billion that we're going to spend rather than putting it away or putting it for tax, tax reduction. Some people will say, oh, a lot of this is just one-time money. Well, one-time money becomes permanent spending. You have the choice now and in the future whether or not you're going to spend it for a sales tax reduction for food or for more spending for the judiciary or whether or not you're going to say the taxpayers need to have a break. This won't matter in the long run whether or not we give it to the legislature to appropriate in fees or in state general fund, except that. You know, I remember a couple years ago we had a constitutional amendment being proposed that we should control the state spending by a constitutional amendment. You remember that? St the state chamber was here saying, that's the way we'll control spending. That's the way we'll get a handle on runaway inflation and spending in the state capital. And I came down here and I said, we don't need that. We don't need to have a constitutional amendment. What we need is 63 men and women that'll say no. And I'm still looking for 63 for this session. For further discussion, the chair recognizes Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in strong support for HB 2541. You know, I respect and I like my colleague from Eastboro, and I appreciate the work that he does on the Appropriations Committee, I think it is. But in this instance, he's wrong. <laughs> what this is about, what this is about is reducing docket fees. During the troubles that we've had over the past 10, 12 years with our budget, in order to keep the courts open, we had to raise docket fees because the money was not there from taxes to keep the doors open. And so very reluctantly, the court came to us and said, if you can't keep the doors open out of the state general fund, we've got to raise docket fees. And some of us very reluctantly voted for that, knowing that it was the wrong thing to do. Why is it the wrong thing to do? It's about as regressive a tax as you could ever impose on somebody. Go get yourself a traffic ticket sometime and compare the fines with the docket fees. I think in most instances you will find that you're paying more in docket fee than you are in fine. And that's because the money wasn't there. 
I heard my good friend from East Borough's mention of efficiencies in the court. Roughly 90% of the court's budget is people. Courts don't buy trucks. Courts live in courthouses that for the most part are paid for by the county. Courts money is spent on judges and clerks and court services officers, etc. So when you cut a judicial budget, you cut people. And you cut people who are necessary to keep the cogs of justice grinding. When my friend talks about efficiencies, perhaps he's not aware of some of the things that your courts have done over the past 10 years or so with respect to efficiency. For example, the Blue Ribbon Commission that was appointed by Chief Justice Nuss some years ago and on which our distinguished friend and colleague, the former prosecutor from Finney County, served with honor and distinction, took, took serious steps to bring the courts into the 21st century so that there could be work sharing between a clerk or even a judge in one of those one judge per county counties and judges say in Wichita where you have 20, 25 judges somewhere in that range now. In other words, cases can be assigned out across the state because they have the electronic system to make it happen. There's also electronic filing in Kansas. It's called e-file. The end result of that is that I can practice law just as well in Seward County as I can in Sedgwick County. I can practice law just as well from here in Topeka as I could practice if I was at home in Wichita. Those things were all accomplished long before COVID. And we are darn glad that these, those things were in place during the COVID emergency. Uh, my friend made reference to the one judge per county rule. And that the court had not shown up to say, amend the statutes or the laws to get rid of one judge in every county in Kansas. Well, I don't speak for the court, certainly not. But I would speculate that the reason they don't do that is it's not their place. It's not their place to tell us that we should abandon a rule that has been our rule since 1861. It's been a strong preference of the legislature, particularly those in rural counties, that every county have a judge, a resident judge in that county. If you all want to change that rule, I'll probably stand with you. But don't criticize the court for not having changed the rule because it's not their rule and it's not their place to tell us what to do. So I want to try to wrap this up, but I just want to make it very clear to you that this is certainly not a partisan issue, as you can see. My friend from Eastboro and I are, sit on the same side of the aisle, but we're on a very different side on this particular issue. So if you want to keep funding courts through docket fees, then vote this down. But I don't think that's what any of us would really want to do. I think we're a lot better off to pay for courts out of our tax money than we are out of a whole host of fees. So I appreciate your time and consideration and ask your support for House Bill 2541. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, Representative Sutton, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's been some, some uh, discussion I didn't necessarily anticipate today, but uh, some excellent points were brought up. Uh, I do think it's an excellent idea, particularly in light of uh, the rollout of e-courts and, and e-filing, uh, as well as the population shift, thus the crime shift that's going on in our, in our state, that uh, maybe one judge per county is, is reviewed. Uh, 
The former speaker was exactly correct that the court will never come and advocate for that uh, because it's a policy decision. That's ours to decide, and they may weigh in on it if we ever, if we ever float that idea, but uh, it's a policy decision. It's not part of their budget. Speaking of which, we've also heard some discussion about increasing budget and increasing personnel, and, and this is uh, the wrong way down the, down the road. And those are valid points, valid discussion, not on this bill, but those are valid discussions that we need to have when we're, when we're working the budget. This bill touches none of that. This, as near as I can tell, is an accounting cleanup. We should be the ones appropriating the funds. We shouldn't rely on an agency to fund themselves through fees. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a horrible practice when you're talking about law. Anyway, I, I could continue here, but I'm going to stop. I, I've put most of you to sleep. I get it. <laughs> when the committee rises to report, I move that it reports HB 2541 favorably. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Congratulations, Representative. You cleared the gallery. <laughs> You've heard the motion by Representative Sutton to report House Bill 2541 favorably. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The motion passes. Next item of business is House Bill 2676. For the purpose of carrying House Bill 2676, the chair recognizes Representative Clifford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there were minor technical amendments. I move adoption of the committee report on House Bill 2676. You've heard the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, no. The motion passes. Please continue. House Bill 2676 was heard in the Local Government Committee. It was requested by former uh, State Representative Jim Howell, who is now a County Commissioner in Sedgwick County. It does two things. Uh, it permits counties by resolution to create a code inspection and enforcement fund. And number two, it amends the County Equipment Fund to call it a County Equipment and Technology Fund. It does not create any new fees. There was a minimal fiscal note. Uh, there were three proponents, no opponents, no neutrals. I will stand for questions. Does any member desire to speak to the bill? The chair recognizes Representative Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the previous speaker did a good job to explain this bill. Uh, one thing I might add is that even though Sedgwick County brought this measure forward to us, it is applicable um, statewide. So any county can now um, establish, um, if, if they want to do so, um, such a, um, a uh, fee, or, or I'm sorry, such an account within their accounting system so that they can better track those um, expenses in that area of uh, code, code inspection and enforcement. So it would be called the Code Inspection and Enforcement Fund. So that would be the only thing I would add. I just want to make sure that you know it's applicable count, or statewide and that any county can exercise that. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Seeing none. Representative Clifford, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you might not know if you haven't served as a county commissioner, we essentially have six functions. Uh, law enforcement, road and bridge, public health, solid waste, soil conservation, and uh, getting rid of attorneys. Uh, actually, it's noxious weeds. Uh, and we do need uh, statutory uh, permission to create funds. So uh, I move that when the body rises to report, they report House Bill 2676 favorably for passage as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It was not amended during the discussion. You've heard the motion by Representative Clifford to report House Bill 2676 favorably. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, no. no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The motion passes.
The next item of business is House Bill 2582. For the purpose of carrying House Bill 2582, the chair recognizes Representative Tim Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There were amendments. I would move the adoption of the committee report. You've heard the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, no. The motion passes and the committee report is adopted. Please continue. This bill basically directs the Department of Children and Family Services to share more information with law enforcement. It was something that was studied last year in the Oversight Committee and then brought to the Children and Seniors Committee. And after it was approved there with a couple small amendments, it then went to the judiciary after uh, we thought we needed to have a look at a couple legal bill, legal issues on the sharing of juvenile information passed uh, and it was very well accepted. I want to thank the Children and Family Services for working with us. Several proponents, no opponents, and there is no cost to this. I would stand for questions. For discussion on the bill, the chair recognizes Representative Owsley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think the previous speaker did a good job of explaining the bill, and I would urge your support for, sorry, I'm wearing my glasses, 2582. Thank you. For further discussion, the chair recognizes Representative Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, being a former teacher and therefore required reporter, and my wife is a marriage and family therapist, also a, re a required reporter. We've always had a buffer between us and whoever was uh, in charge of all this. In this case, it's DCF. I think by allowing that information to be open of who the reporter was, we are losing that buffer, that information will come back and allow whoever maybe to take some kind of a challenge against us. So we didn't, uh, I, I won't be agreeing with this uh, bill, but I just want to bring this to your attention that it's very important for re uh, uh, mandated reporters to have that protection, that buffer between us and DCF so that we will report uh, something happening to a child, but it's up to them to make the decision of what they're going to do, whether they're going to turn it over to the law enforcement agency or whether they're just going to let it slide. Maybe We let them do the investigation. We do the reporting. So we do not, we need that buffer. Thank you. Thank you. For further discussion, the chair recognizes Representative Watsinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could the bill uh, carrier please come up for questions? <clears throat> I'm wondering if this bill makes it easier for all the different divisions to know what's going on with the child. I've had problems with foster parents not getting any information about where a child is in the court and whether or not they couldn't find someone to take care of them. So I'm just wondering if this, this bill helps make the, everything clear for everyone involved. From the testimony that I have heard in my experience as a child mm -hmm. abuse investigator, I see that it does this because it's going to now share that to those people who are having to make some very important decisions on is that child in need of care, are they in danger, uh, and we do know that foster families are often the last to know about what is happening. So yes, I do believe that this bill will enhance that. And it will include the foster families in this chain of, of information, for sure. Can I just double check? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Hmm. 
The foster family is not directly addressed in this bill. It is, this is relating more to the law enforcement. Okay, thank you. I, I do have a little bit of a problem. I think that there is a, a true break in communication with all the people that take care of foster kids. I don't think it, it, it makes sense to not include the very people who are trying to give some stability to kids. I had a friend who had a foster daughter. They have now adopted her after all of this, but the, the girl was in court and they didn't know what to do with where to put her. Never called the foster parents and said, can you take her back? Because she was in a different county. I think the most important thing we need to do for these children is to make sure that everyone that has a stake in this knows what's going on and we're following them from the beginning to the end and back again. I would like to see that added. Thank you. For further discussion on the bill, the chair recognizes Representative Helmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not prepared to speak, so I hope this comes across well. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, about what happened in Wichita. I'm a mandated reporter, as you probably remember. I've told you several times as a teacher. I was at a school in the vicinity of that school, and the school was Wichita. It was a school in Wichita, but there had been a, an SRO, which is a school resource officer, that was on patrol several times, and he had gone to a home. He had been called several times to a home and with his partner, and this was probably about three or four years ago, and they had gone to this home several times for domestic violence. They went one day, and they knocked on the door. The man answered. They asked to see the woman. The man said the woman had gone to the grocery store to get milk for the child. He said, well, I want to talk to her. The, the, the policeman said, I want to talk to her. I need to talk to her and make sure he's so, she's okay. The, the husband said, she's okay, she went to the, the grocery store to get milk for the child. The, the policeman said, okay, well, um, we'll be back later, I just want to make sure she's okay, if, if everything's okay. So he left, he went and got in the car with, the, with his female officer and said, evidently, everything's okay, the man looks okay. Let's go on. We'll come back later. And so they drive down the road. And, he, and so the female officer says, well, what did he say? And he said, well, he said that she went to the grocery store to get milk for the children. Children, they have no children. They had been there. And the, what happened is... They had been there several times. They never knew that there were babies in that house. They turned around and went back. And now you'll probably remember the story if you can go back two or three years. It was probably three years ago. There was a skeleton of, of a baby in a crib, and one child was still alive. This bill is meant, and why I'm telling you this story, those officers had, there were beat officers. They had never been given information that there were children in that home because DCF was never allowed when, when those officers were on patrol that there were children in that home. So this, this bill is one of those bills. It's a bill meant that when an officer goes out and does a domestic violence that they can get information that there are children in a home. So we've got to open up information that there are children in homes of domestic violence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For further discussion on the bill, the chair recognizes Representative Esau.
Could the carrier stand for a question real quick, please? Yes. So when this bill came up, I believe you serve on the uh, committee, the joint or oversight committee that is looking into this where it came up. Is that correct? Yes, I do. And when the concern came up from law enforcement, I believe that a representative from the agency was in the room and was rather surprised to find out that the cooperation that we thought was in statute wasn't actually happening? That is correct. DCF was very surprised. And they immediately, pretty much within the day, went out and tried to work out a compromise so that we could have the two working together to cooperate to protect children? Most cooperative. I'm very impressed with their, their rapid action. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can understand some of the concerns about foster parents being informed about what's going on. I think perhaps we need to address that in some other legislation. It's not in this bill because this bill was very simple. It was about fixing a communication problem between agency and law enforcement. And no one wanted to not cooperate. We wanted to protect those folks that are mandatory reporters. We wanted to protect folks that were simply sharing concerns that they had so that they were not um, acted against in any way. I think some of the things that have come up kind of maybe perhaps confuse what the issue is with this bill. And it sounds complicated because it's legal and we're trying to make sure that that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, but it is a good bill. It will do good things for our kids that are perhaps in danger and will help us not duplicate efforts between law enforcement and DCF. So I do strongly encourage you to support the bill. The chair recognizes Representative Kincannon for further discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the conversation going on, the discussion on this issue. Um, this, this bill is just addressing the, the communication between law enforcement and DCF. Um, the, the conversation about foster parents being involved, they are already notified. They already uh, have that information as long as the court allows it. So that's already, that's in separate statute. This is just addressing, a, just like the previous speaker uh, stated, an issue that we found in the Child Welfare Oversight Committee where um, they, the law enforcement were not, they were not getting the information that was needed to investigate crime. They said it was like trying to investigate a burglary without being able to speak to the person who had called it in, without being able to speak to any witnesses because DCF was pr protecting that information, the attorneys um, within DCF. We, we tried to um, have a compromise there and that wasn't working out, so we just um, developed a bill to address it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If there is no further discussion, Representative Johnson, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for those comments. Again, this is about expressing information to law enforcement. Everybody that is on those committees have hearts of gold, and I think those questions will be addressed. Mr. Chair, I move that when the committee rises to report it, report House Bill 2582 favorably for adoption. You've heard the motion by Representative Johnson to report House Bill 2582 favorably. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The motion passes. This concludes our general orders. The chair recognizes the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move we rise and report. You've heard the motion to rise and report. All in favor signify by saying aye. All opposed, no. The motion passes. The clerk will read the committee report.
Mr. Speaker, your committee of the whole recommends House Bill 2541 be passed. House Bills 2674, 2676, 2582 be passed as amended. House Concurrent Resolution 5032 be adopted. The Speaker recognizes Representative Hyland for a motion to adopt the Committee of the Whole Report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the Committee of the Whole Report. You've heard the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Committee Report is adopted. Reports of Standing Committees, the Clerk will read. Committee on Social Sur Services Budget recommends House Bill 2253 be amended. The bill be passed as amended. Committee on Insurance and Pensions recommends Senate Bill 399 be passed. Committee on Insurance and Pensions recommends Senate Bill 448 be passed. Committee on Health and Human Services recommends House Bill 2734 be passed. Committee on Health and Human Services recommends Senate Bill 200 be amended. The bill be passed as amended. Committee on Insurance and Pensions recommends Senate Bill 28 be amended by substituting a new bill to be designated as House Substitute for Senate Bill Number 28 as follows. An act concerning insurance relating to the regulation of pharmacy benefits managers requiring licensure rather than registration for such entities. Enacting the Pharmacy Benefits Manager Licensure Act and the substitute bill be passed. Committee on Taxation recommends House Bill 2394 be amended. The bill be passed as amended. Committee on Appropriations recommends House Bill 2712 be passed. Committee on Taxation recommends House Bill 2724 be amended. The bill be passed as amended. Announcements. Representative Bill Clifford will replace Representative Samantha Potter Partial on the House Taxation Committee for today, March 15th. The appointment expires at the end of the day. Representative Woodard for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Democrats will have agenda tomorrow morning at 8.30 in 152 South. 8.30 tomorrow in 152 South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Barker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, is having a reception tonight at the Topeka Country Club from 6 to 7.30. All members of the House are invited. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are there any further announcements? Representative Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, pro tem, colleagues. On the 21st of this month, I will be presenting to this body a request for a resolution recognizing the lifelong service of Representative Russ Jennings to the state of Kansas. This is nonpartisan. He was friends across the aisle. I am encouraging as many members as we can get to sign on as a sponsor for this. It will be at my desk back at 117 and thereafter in my office at 512 North with my OA. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you very much. Are there any further announcements? Seeing none, Speaker recognizes Majority Leader Hawkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Republicans, we will have calendar tomorrow morning at 8.30 in the old Supreme Courtroom body. You are all invited to join Senate President Ty Masterson and House Minority Leader Tom Sawyer at the 60th annual Kansas Prayer Breakfast. It will be held at the Fellowship Bible Church at 6800 Southwest 10th Avenue tomorrow morning at 6.30 a.m. Mr. Speaker, I move the House adjourn until Wednesday, March 16th at 11 a.m. Heard the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The House is adjourned.